Yuval Noah Harari is a professor in history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and an international best-selling author whose book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, has been translated into nearly 40 languages and has been recommended by Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg and former President Barack Obama as essential reading. First published in Israel in 2011 and translated into English in 2014, Sapiens explores the history of the human race, beginning with the Stone Age and ending with the future of humankind. His recent book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, starts where Sapiens left off and investigates the possibilities of the future and its implications on humankind. The success of Sapiens and Homo Deus shot Harari into worldwide fame and led to him becoming a speaker at conferences worldwide where he discusses human history, artificial intelligence and the future. Harari was a speaker at the Global Artificial Intelligence Summit Forum in Hangzhou of the summer. I spoke with him in front of a live audience about the implications of artificial intelligence on the future of the human race. When you make another visit to China, to Hangzhou, you'll be received by a bunch of uh, AI-powered robots instead of us. So my question is, are our jobs still safe? Nobody really has any idea how the job market would look like in 20 or 30 years. There is a general agreement among experts that it will be very different, but, um, and that many jobs will disappear, we don't know if enough new jobs will appear to replace all the lost jobs. And even if some new jobs appear, we don't know what they are. And therefore, we, it's very difficult to prepare young people today to fulfill these future jobs because we don't know what they are. I, I think for the first time in history, we don't know what to teach children in school or even students in college most of what we teach will probably be irrelevant to the job market and to life in 2040 or 2050. What kind of jobs are more likely to, to be, be replaced exactly by yes. all these AI robots or computers? Jobs that involve mainly monotonous activities. It doesn't matter if it's physical or cognitive. As long as it's a repetitive, monotonous activity, are the easiest to replace. So this involves not just manual laborers in textile factories or truck drivers, but even something like a doctor. Many doctors, most of what they do is to diagnose disease and just recognize biological patterns in your body. And this is something which will be relatively easy to replace. If you're a doctor who is researching a new cure for cancer, and this demands a lot of creativity and flexibility, then that's a different matter. But to many doctors who just diagnose disease, this will probably be much easier and more efficiently done by an AI than by a human being. But even with doctors, I mean, sometimes they do involve some psychology, psychological skills, emotional, all these you know, psychological things, non-tangible part of the jobs. Do you think they will still remain in the future? So yes, emotional care will definitely still be a central part of the job of any doctor. But even when it comes to emotional care, AI could be better than a human doctor because AI will be able, for example, to diagnose your exact emotional state much better than most human doctors. Emotions are not some you know, spiritual quality. Uh, they are a biological phenomenon, just like disease. The same way AI will be able to diagnose your disease, your biological condition in this sense, it will also be extremely accurate in identifying your exact emotional state. After all, even today, how does my doctor know what is my emotional state? The doctor rely on signals that my body or I am giving it. Uh, first of all, the doctor listens to what I say. She listens both to the words, but also to the tone of voice. There is a difference between the tone of a fearful person and an angry person. 
And secondly, the doctor looks at my face, at the visual signals, and there is a difference between the visual expression, the muscle movements, the eyes, the mouth, of uh, somebody who is fearful and somebody who is angry. Now this is exactly the kind of pattern recognition that AI is learning to do better than human beings. The AI will be able to analyze my tone of voice and my facial expression and know exactly how I'm feeling. And finally, um, AI will be able to do something that human doctors just can't do. If I sitting now is my doctor, he looks at my face, he listens to my voice, but he cannot see what's happening in my brain. He cannot see what's happening to my heart. And AI, if you connect it to biometric sensors on or inside the body, will be able to monitor all these internal signals as well, and therefore will be able to identify far more accurately how I'm feeling than even the best human doctor could. Actually, in some situations, it could be a good thing, because, you know, with a human doctor, I become angry at the doctor, very often the doctor becomes angry also and starts shouting at me if he's not a very good doctor. Uh, AI will never be angry. If I shout at an AI doctor, the doctor just knows, oh, this human is now angry. And based on my statistical database, I know that the best thing to do when this kind of person is very angry is to say this or to say that. And the AI will react in the most appropriate way. Whereas the human doctor, because he has emotions of his own, even if he knows, oh, this person, he's now just told him he has cancer and he's angry and he's shouting, it won't help if I shout at him. But this is just intellectual knowledge. Because you're emotional yourself, you may become very angry and shout back, which is not helpful. Do you think in the future that AIs might have a decision-making or free-minded decision-making power which would enable them to make decisions against human beings' wills? I don't think there is any indication that AI is uh, in the process of developing consciousness or developing free will. But I do think that very soon AI will be so complex that we won't understand how it reaches decisions and our ability to predict or to instruct the decisions of the AI will decrease. More and more decisions will be taken by AI without humans being able to understand why the AI decided like this and not like that. For example, more and more banks and corporations are even now giving AI uh, authority to make decisions about, for example, whether to give you a loan or whether to hire you to a new job. And they increasingly rely on the AI without understanding how the AI reaches a decision. I apply for the bank to get a loan, and the bank says, no, we don't give you a loan. And you ask the bank, why not? And the bank says, the algorithm said, no. The AI said not to give you a loan. And you ask, why not? What's wrong with me? And the bank says, we don't know. We just trust the AI. This is why we have the AI, because it can recognize patterns in the data, and it can reach conclusions that no human being can. And we trust the AI, and we don't know why the AI refused to give you a loan. AI is highly intelligent, but at the same time, no consciousness. Uh, what, what do you think it means, it implies to the future society, socially speaking? So AI may be something very scary and problematic for human beings. Maybe it results in many humans losing their job, losing their economic power, losing their political power. People, all the power concentrated in the hands of a very small elite. And most people having no power and even no understanding what's happening in the world and why am I treated the way I'm treated. So this is one scenario which is very negative. And then, of course, you have positive scenarios that AI releases humans from many of the more boring and, and difficult jobs, like, you know, to drive a truck all day or to work in a textile factory all day. It's not a very nice job necessarily. And it could be good that AI takes it. And if the profits, if the uh, wealth, is distributed between all people or most people more equally, 
then this can free the time of people to engage in activities which are much more meaningful for them. It could be with their family, it could be with the uh, art or religion or meditation. And um, AI could empower people instead of taking the power away. And uh, again, the question is who controls the AI and who controls the data? So who should be doing that job? I mean, what should we do? The government introducing new laws, banning scientists doing research on certain aspects or making all these guidelines for all these industry insiders to make sure that we only in the future make beneficial AIs instead of, say, evil AIs in the mm -hmm. future. We need three things to, to begin with. Uh, to prevent the dangerous possibilities from, from being realized. First of all, we need a political debate about these issues. Secondly, uh, we need debate about the control of data to regulate the ownership of data. And thirdly, we need uh, action on a global level. We need global cooperation. So first, we need to start having a serious political debate about these issues because maybe this is the most important political question of our time, and it's not a good idea to leave it to the free market and to private corporations uh, to decide the policy, which is uh, uh, currently what is happening, that many governments around the world are simply oblivious to uh, the, the fast rise of artificial intelligence, and much of the most important decisions, many of the most important decisions, are taken just by private corporations that don't represent anybody. And I, I'm not against, of course, private corporations moving forward and, and thinking about these issues. Um, I'm just think, I just think that we can't leave it just to them. The public and the governments need to be involved. The second point is about the ownership of data. You know, what we need to realize is that the most important asset in the 21st century is going to be data, and especially personal data, my data. If in the past the most important asset was land, and you had conflict about who owns the land, and then it was factories and machinery, and you had conflicts, who will own the factories and the machinery? In the 21st century, the key question is who owns the data, especially my own data, like my biometric data, my DNA, my medical record, uh, the record of everything I do every day. At present, this data is being accumulated by a, a few organizations, some of them governmental organizations, some of them are private corporations, and this data will be the key to control the world. Whoever has enough data and enough computing power will be able to decipher and predict uh, human behavior. And we, we are far from realizing this situation, and we need here a completely new thinking about ownership and to give people some ownership over their own data. And the third point is that we need global cooperation on this because AI, the rise of AI, is a global revolution. And if just one country takes action about the potential dangers, it will not prevent the continuation of the dangerous development in other countries. For example, if you're afraid of giving AI control of weapons and AI being able to fire and to kill people uh, without any authorization from, from humans. So if you're afraid of a particular development like uh, autonomous weapons, the only serious way to stop it is through global cooperation. Go back to your room. If I do. Are you ever going to let me out? Yes. Stop. Stop. Ava, I said stop. Many people see AI in the future probably will be the biggest danger that human beings is confronted with. Is the danger from 
AI itself that maybe one day is going to own its say free hmm. mind and then do things dangerous or harmful to human beings or are you more worried about the uh, AI technology being manipulated uh, and abused by a, a bunch of people with certain evil-minded people in the future and do harmful things to human beings? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first danger of AI developing consciousness and emotions and aims of its own and then tries to destroy humankind because of its own thoughts and emotions, this is unlikely. It's not completely impossible, but it seems unlikely uh, because, again, so far, even though there is an immense development of computer intelligence, we don't see any development of computer consciousness. It seems that computers are developing intelligence in a very different way from humans and other animals. Animals, mammals, they develop intelligence by developing consciousness. We solve problems by having feelings. Computers act in a completely different way. And there is no reason and so far no indication that they are anywhere on the road to developing feelings and emotions and desires of their own. The real danger is that it's not going to be computers against humans. It's going to be some humans empowered by the new technology against the rest of humanity. Uh, if we are not careful, the immense powers of AI may come to serve a small number of countries or even uh, uh, some classes within a country, while most people will lose their economic and political power and then we'll see a much more unequal human society than in any previous time in history. It's a bit like what happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution that the invention of steam engines and trains and electricity empowered the upper classes in a few countries like Britain and France and Germany. Most people in most countries like China, like India, were left far behind. And for many years, these few industrial powers conquered and exploited very brutally most of humankind. If we are not careful, the same thing may happen again in the 21st century with AI, perhaps with different countries, but the danger is, is there. But the concern of the loss of jobs, uh, well, we've seen concerns like that, mm -hmm. like you mentioned in the 19th century when we had the, we had the industrialization, mm -hmm. people were worried about this, and then new technology brought new jobs. So mm -hmm. do you think it's the same concern being repeated again that new technology would actually not just drive but also some new opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, we don't know for sure what will happen, but it's dangerous to assume that what happened in the 19th century will repeat itself exactly in the 21st century because there are two main differences between the current revolution and the industrial revolution of the 19th century. Humans have two basic kinds of ability, physical and cognitive. Now, in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, machines competed with us in physical abilities, but not in cognitive abilities. So what we saw over the last century is that humans increasingly moving to working in jobs that require cognitive abilities. Now what is happening is that machines begin to compete in cognitive abilities as well. And we don't know of a third kind of ability that we can say, oh, okay, so they are better in physical uh, jobs and they are better in cognitive skills, so we will do that. We don't know what this third kind of skill might be. The other problem is that the pace of change is accelerating. And even if there are new jobs, it's unclear whether the people who lost their jobs will have the time to retrain themselves and gain the necessary skills for the new jobs. In the previous occasion, when you lost your job in the farm, as a, as a farmer, you moved to the city, and you could find a new job in the factory because these jobs were, many of them, were low-skilled jobs. And within a few weeks or months, you could learn how to operate the machine and find a job. 
But in the future, when people think about what new jobs will appear, they usually say that the new jobs will involve a lot of creativity and originality and high skills, something which is not routine, because this is AI can do easily, things like designing virtual reality games. But the problem is that this is high skill. So if I'm a 40-year-old textile worker and I just lost my job to a robot, but there is a new job designing a virtual reality game, I don't have the skills. And it will take me many, many years, if at all, to acquire these skills. So we could have a situation in which there are many new jobs, but the people who lost their jobs just can't have the necessary skills to work in that. Optimists say there is always one ability owned by human beings that is beyond non-conscious algorithms. Do you believe so? The one thing that we have and AI is unlikely to have in the foreseeable future is consciousness. Again, the ability to feel, the ability to feel fear or love or hate or pain or anything at all. Unfortunately, for most jobs in the economy, you don't really need that. Most jobs in the economy require a tiny part of the human ability. I mean, there are a million things that a taxi driver, a human taxi driver can do and a self-driving car cannot do, like appreciate a joke. The economy doesn't need any of these things. It just needs a taxi to take you from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. The economy is really underutilizing uh, this human potential. What is more likely to happen in the future with the job market? You mentioned the word polarization that in the future we might have high school workers, low school workers, but the middle school workers will be made abundant by all these automation AIs in the future. Well, when you're talking about very high skill, very creative, very like flexible, non-routine kinds of jobs, this for the foreseeable future, it will be still difficult to replace that with AI. If we mentioned, for example, doctors, so to do routine tests and diagnose diseases, this is something that is just pattern recognition and AI will be able to do better. But then you have very creative and skillful doctors who research, say, cancer and try to find a new medicine for that. And this kind of skill, it will be much harder, not impossible, but much harder for AI to do in, say, 50 or 100 years. So you will still have jobs for the like, upper 10% of the medical community, but the 90% at the bottom who are doing more routine jobs, they will lose their jobs. Again, at, at the very bottom, you may find people who, whose jobs are so um, cheap that maybe it's not economical to even try and replace them. So the, the greatest danger is about the middle section jobs that you pay high salaries today and so corporations will have an incentive to replace these expensive workers with AI but they're doing routine job so it's easy to replace them. And it's not just the ordinary doctor, it's something like say a trader in the stock exchange. They make a lot of money, these traders, but it's relatively easy going to be to replace them with AI. So this is the most, the greatest danger for the jobs are in the middle. When you get a high salary, so there is an incentive to, 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 to kick you off, but you're still doing a rather routine job, so it's easy to replace you. If the majority of the population are being made abundant by technology, so how do we describe human values again? How do we understand the word humanity again. Mm -hmm. If we leave aside the question of how to support these people, let's say we have some scheme of universal basic income, so we use all the wealth generated by the computers and robots and distribute it in such a way that everybody has enough to eat and wear and, and so forth, so let, let's put aside this problem. Then the big problem becomes meaning and purpose and what do people do all day and what is the meaning of, of, of human life. Ideally, people could use the opportunity to really explore 
the, their mind, their consciousness, the potential, their ability. Because we know very little about the human mind and about the human potential. For most of history, we've been so preoccupied with, you know, growing rice and with manufacturing shirts that we had very little time to explore the full potential of, of, of humanity. And maybe finally we will have the opportunity to do that. So this is one option. But of course, humans being humans, the danger is that many of them will just want to have pleasant and exciting experiences. And uh, these will be more cheaply and easily provided by drugs, new kinds of drugs, and uh, computer games. Not computer games like today, but three-dimensional virtual reality computer games, which you can immerse yourself inside the game. And more and more people will spend their lives not just looking at smartphones like today, but immersed in virtual reality, which in a way is not completely new phenomenon, because you can say that people have been finding meaning in virtual realities for thousands of years. We previously just called these virtual reality games religions, and they were made not in computers, but in books and in the imagination of people. If you think what is a religion like Judaism or Christianity or Islam, it's basically a virtual reality game. You imagine all kinds of laws that don't exist anywhere except in your, in, in your mind, uh, you have to pray five times a day, you should eat this, you shouldn't eat that, all kinds of laws. If you follow the laws of the game, you gain points. If you break a law, you lose points. And by the end of the life, if you gain enough points, you move up to the next level of the game, uh, to heaven. And people for thousands of years played these virtual reality games and found meaning in them. So maybe they will continue to do it in the 21st century just with the help of computers. So whose job is safe? The jobs that we have now here at the venue. TV host? Uh, it will be easy to replace, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. The, this, I mean, this. even today you begin to have, you know, like pop star holograms, which are just, you know, a hologram and people still admire them. So. It's a sad news. A cameraman? Uh, will also, I think, I'm afraid, will be easy to, re to replace. Journalists? Depends what kind of, of articles you're writing. If you're writing routine articles like covering sports events, uh -huh. then it's easy. If you're writing, you know, investigative journalism, you go to expose some big scandal and you have to... Uh, this is very difficult to replace. You mean paparazzis? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, serious investigative journalism. Okay. Again, I think this is true of all professions, doctor, scholar, translator. I mean, it's not that some professions are unsafe and some professions are not. Right. Every pro almost every profession is divided. So to translate the manual of the car will probably be automated within the next 10 years or so. Hmm. But to translate poetry, this will take a lot more time. Yeah, I'll and it's the same job. with scholarship and again, the same with journalism and, 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 and so forth. I'll change my job in translating poems in the future. <laughs>